Hello, it's me, Lance Nilsson with the Outcast Creative. Now, I've had a bit of a mad um, 72 hours, guys, so apologies. Uh, the date for this stream was wrong on the channel, um, so I was expecting to, I, I'll be expecting to have slightly more viewers than this, but it's going to stay up there for good, and I can promote it later. Got a great guest on today whose uh, book I'm still reading. It's up here behind me. Um, his, that's not the only book that he's done. He is a filmographer of sorts and has uh, written about various uh, favourite filmmakers and stars of mine, including Burt Reynolds, uh, independent director Tom DeCillo, whose uh, life, I feel, replicates mine um, on occasions, and others. And we're, we're going to have a bit of a Walter Hill focus, but we will jump around a little bit. Without any further ado, I'm going to bring in Wayne Byrne. It is pronounced Byrne, isn't it? Is that right? It is indeed. Thanks for having me, Lance. Thank God for that. I'm glad I got that right because I'm, I'm terrible at getting people's names um, spelled incorrectly. Um, well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I spotted that you've got the Canon Films Masters of the Universe movie poster behind you. Is it, That's the UK quad, isn't it? Is that right? It is. It is. That's the one. And it's the one I always associated with that film because it's also the, the UK Ireland VHS cover that I would have right. grown up with as well. So, you know, to me, it's it's absolutely iconic because it was the first movie I ever saw in the cinema. So this movie right here is responsible for me, for all these books and for my interest in cinema and for any teachings I do. So thank you, Canon Movies, for financing such a... That, that's that's interesting. Uh, have you uh, have you ever thought about doing a, a book about the, the films of Canon, the two Chucks? Is that maybe something you might delve into later? It's something I have thought of, you know, and I'm coming up with ideas for interesting projects. But, you know, it has actually been widely documented. There's been a few books and there's been a few documentaries. So yeah. I, always, I always try and go for things which have been kind of unheralded in literature. Yeah. You know, and, you know, but I would love to do someday maybe a, a book on Masters of the Universe, because by all accounts, it was a, you know, an interesting production and uh, an interesting period for Canon Films. Yeah. But yeah, it's, a, it's an important movie for me. So it's nice to have a reminder every day of the movie which you know has given me this life so you, you do always remember the first film that you saw in the cinema um and i mean the first one that really had a massive impact on me was star wars i saw about four films in the same year and they were bambi which was the first candle shoe which i don't know whether you saw that a very young jodie foster and david niven which was also a disney movie star wars and then i think it was either escape to or return to which mountain one of the which mountain right. movies obviously star wars was the one that had the big impact and is responsible for the uh step into the world of filmmaking and all things creative that i um found myself being you know hurtled towards whether i liked it or not and we could do a whole other stream about that but yeah and the tagline for masters of the universe was the star wars of the 80s which i didn't don't think it quite lived up to but you know it's certainly yeah, that, I, can't, I can't i can't remember that being the tagline on the the uk poster was it was it it that? was it was indeed yeah i think it's i think it's up in the top corner here but uh and if I, I go, I if, I, if i go move everything now everything will just fall apart no no, no okay. don't um <laughs> i did have a uk cinema quad for that for a long time for a long time and i remember it um it has that actress in it with the really piercing eyes meg what's the name that was in they live Oh God, yeah, Meg yeah. Foster. Meg, Meg Foster. Foster, yeah, yeah. Um, she was very striking. She is, and she had a great costume in that. And do you know what? The bits of that film that were actually set in the in the in the on the planet and stuff were kind of mm -hmm. cool. But then it, they did that. Oh, I know how we'll get away with that building big sets and castles and things. And well, the thing is, you know, we'll Canon had a had a Canon had a reputation for being kind of the ultra low budget, penny pinching studio. But I mean, yeah. I think up to that point that throne room set for masters of the universe was the biggest set built for a hollywood movie i think it was connected to the sound stages at warner brothers or something like that really? so i mean they really threw a few quid at that movie and it looks it i mean it's a million dollars it's it's a beautiful looking movie so if anyone you know when they talk about canon being being a cheap production house i mean look at that movie they really did when they wanted to they could spend some money now if you look at superman 4 for example you can see uh don't get me started on that. Uh, I, I remember seeing that at the cinema and and like I was expecting it to be a really good movie and, and it was just cringingly bad um, yeah. from, from the very first shot of him flying towards the screen, which was used footage that they haven't hadn't even yeah. 
retemplated it properly and had a big black line around him and that's right and they recycle it for the whole movie it's yeah terrible. and it was it was it was just yeah it was god awful but um yeah but uh, i mean let's let let's let's talk about you and walter hill and 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 that kind of thing i mean you you've done a few books i'm gonna i'm gonna actually let's share screen here and i'm gonna bring bring up a selection of your works and actually that reminds me um, I, if you're watching this on replay, by then I will have edited all the links uh, to Wayne's stuff so you can find it easily. Um, but um, you've got a few books out um, on a few different topics. I think people that watch my stuff will be very interested to know about. You've got Welcome to Elm Street, which I assume is covering all the Elm Street movies. Yeah, um, all the movies and the TV show. So that was one of the that was one of the first horror films I ever saw in the cinema was the original Nightmare on Elm Street. I think I saw Extro the same year, which is a weird British <laughs> alien horror film that not many people have seen. That was a double I remember bill. that. I used to have the VHS of that. I know, right? And and that was like a double bill with scanners. I mean, Extro was just a very strange movie. Um, yeah. Now that, that was a double bill with scanners, which was Michael Ironside. That was a great film. Yeah. Um, and then um, you got the Walter Hill book there. Uh, Nick McLean, who's a uh, director of photography. Yeah, um, Nick McLean is an absolute legend of a cinematographer. I mean, you look up his filmography, and he yeah, he's like he's almost like the visual architect of the new Hollywood. I mean, some of the yeah. stuff that he has done is just incredibly legendary. Close you know, Encounters uh, of the Third Kind, I think, is one of them, if I remember rightly. Absolutely, yeah. He worked with yeah. Vilmos Sigmund on that, and um, you know, he, into the eighties, he, he became um, an even more celebrated cinematography and he did the Goonies short circuit and he ended up going in to do friends as well, you know, in the nineties, right. but his kids career was just incredible. And it was interesting how we, we met on that. He was, I interviewed him for the Burt Reynolds book because I knew he had done a lot of Burt Reynolds movies and, you know, I, I figured they'd be friends if they'd worked together that much. Yeah. And, you know, I, I got to really, really enjoy Nick and we used to talk a lot. And I said to him one day, you know, Nick, considering the, the movies you have worked on, you know, why is there no book in your career? And he said, you know, he had thought about it or he had tried to do it. And I said, well, listen, I'll do it. Let's do it together. You know, we, this has to be put down on paper to, you know, how he worked on these movies is his own story and what he brought to these films, because he's, he's really worked with the top filmmakers of the last 50 years. And it is an right. incredible story. And he's just an incredible person. You know, I love Nick a lot. So do you split, that's the two of you collaborating. Do you split any profits on that 50-50? Totally 50-50, yeah. Oh, that's great, mate. I'm glad to hear that. I think that's if I was in that situation, that's the, the way I would have done that myself. Um, yeah. Fantastic stuff. I mean, before we, we, we move on to Walter Hill, which is going to be the focus of what we're talking about tonight, I've got to say, I'm a massive Burt Reynolds fan. When I um, was growing up, you know, the go-to kind of stars were sort of Roger Moore was just, just coming onto the scene because first Bond film I ever saw at the cinema was Spy Who Loved Me. That was probably a year after Star Wars or six months later. Um, massive impact on my life. Uh, uh, you know, and then you had your go-to guys on telly, which was like Clint Eastwood, Burt Reynolds. You yeah. know, they'd done the Dirty Harrys and sort of he, he had done um, things like, was it Thunderbolt and Lightfoot? Was was that a Burt Reynolds one? with uh, young... No, Thunderbolt was with Jeff Bridges. Um, he did one with Burt... Clinton Burt doubleheader, which was City Heat, which Nick actually shot. That's right, yeah. And um, uh, and Gator was another one of his early films. I was thinking of, which starts with yeah. the scene in the swamp where they're trying to like nail him down. It's a very good That's movie, right? And I mean, Burt Reynolds, as you say, he was kind of a a perennial on TV back in the eighties, you know, and yeah. I mean, I, I grew up with him, and I think there's that's there's a personal connection to all of these books that I do. That that's yeah, they mean something deeply personal to me. The subjects that I choose, and Burt was just. He was one of you to me. He's almost it's it's like the cinematic version of comfort food. I can stick on Burt Reynolds, any Burt Reynolds movie at any time and just sit and enjoy it. I don't have to be 100 percent invested watching it, but it's just comforting knowing it's on. And and it, it, it's funny as well, because it's amazing how well the best little whorehouse in Texas has aged. I watched that oh. probably about six months ago, and it's still an absolutely cracking film. And not many musicals work on the big screen. No, absolutely. And, um, and the songs still hold up. Dolly's beautiful. You know, yeah, even him singing with her with the fooling around thing kind of works because it, it's not a song that requires a big voice and it's kind of a silly song. And, it, 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 you know, it works. It just it, it just works. Um, yeah. 
And awesome. I mean, the thing was with that book, you know, Bert, my whole reason for writing that book was there have been books on Bert Reynolds. There's many books on Bert Reynolds down the years, but they're generally about his lifestyle, his personal life, things like that. And right. I really, really wanted to celebrate Bert, the actor, the screenwriter, the director, the filmmaker. And it was the right. first book, I think, if I may say so, to do that, you know, to really dig into to his work and celebrate him as an artist. And I went through literally every film he ever made, no, no matter how big or small the road. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, you know, if you're looking for a, a gossip a book on the gossip and who he slept with, and that's a very long list. Um, <laughs> this is not that book, but if you want to know all the minutiae of all the different films he did and the stories behind production, that's what people are going to get. Is that, is yeah. that a fair? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I interviewed many of his friends and colleagues and they all, said the same that this was the book that Bert deserved so. oh that's because I, I you I was assuming you you wrote it after he passed away is that is that is that right I was actually during during the time he passed away at one stage Nick had tried to connect the two of us and right. I got a note from Bert via Nick and somebody else and it was just to say Bert was very happy to hear that I was working on a book you know in in the way I was which was about yeah. him his artistry and that but I never did get to speak to him which was a great regret of mine you know yeah God, it would have been amazing to speak to him but unfortunately things happened the way they did well i'm sure he's looking down with that cheeky smile right now probably um you know very grateful so. that you you wrote it i mean i found one of his last films the most moving and utterly heartbreaking and he frankly deserved an oscar and it was i think it was called the last movie star and he effectively played himself oh and very you, moving yeah you had those wonderful scenes where he intercut with himself talking to him his younger self from the Smokey and the Bandit films yep. and, and and they did it in a way where the younger self was telling him off for the way he had behaved in his life and he'd only got himself to blame and it, it very much was an autobiographical movie about oh, the end totally. of his life and he died I think a year or so after it it came out and I, I was watching it and I was thinking god this is such a brave film to make to kind of fess up to all the things you did wrong and you you kind of know you fucked up and you hurt a lot of people. Yeah. He like has an he, amazing monologue in it near the end yeah. where he, he recounts, you remember when he's lying on the, on the floor in the kitchen in the, the apartment and he's, he's yeah. talking about all the, all the, the people who have died that he grew up with, the streets that he played on, the trees he's climbed and the passing yeah. of life. And he, he's, he's basically, you know, heralding his own imminent passing. And it's such an incredibly moving scene. And as you say, he deserved an Oscar for it. He did. I don't think he was even nominated. And I, I think that was an utter disgrace because he was nominated for best supporting in Boogie Nights. I can't remember if he won it or not. You would know. I can't remember. I think he did. But um, yeah, maybe. I, know, I know that was a film he had uh, some issues with. And I think well, he, did, he didn't want to do it. And he thought it was going to be a turd. And and I don't because it was a new director. Nobody knew uh Paul Paul W S Anderson at that point and um and it was but it was a great movie it's it's yeah fantastic very film. very good film and I know Bert had even after after it was made I think he kind of felt uncomfortable a little bit with the subject matter sure you know because I don't don't think it took a few years maybe for it to to really gain the the kind of the the plaudits that it has and to be taken so seriously as Anderson you know became a more revered director sure but it is a very good film and I think it's uh it's one of Bert's more subtle roles, you know, he he, he definitely plays a, a less less of a version of himself, you know, because sometimes Bert could Bert brings Bert to the screen. Yeah, no, uh, a, a, absolutely. Um, I thought that that film encapsulated that whole era of that yeah. industry really well. I don't know if this is a friend of yours, by the way, but Jennifer Pender says, proud of you, Wayne. Oh, thank you, Jim. Um, um and uh, yeah, absolutely, I, I would be too. Um yeah, so well, it's a shame that you didn't get to to meet him. But we'll we'll do. I'll tell you what. You know what? We might do a Burt Reynolds movies stream another time. In which case, you must come on again and be a guest co-host for that. Oh, absolutely. Um, but let's. Uh, all right, let's 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 move on to to Walter Hill, who's uh, a favourite uh, director of both yours and mine. I mean, I've probably got. You know, people because I often get asked that question you know, because I work in the industry, who are your favourite directors? And and I hear, like, some of my contemporaries um, get asked that question, and I can see them mulling it over, at, not in the way that they go, 
oh, who are my favorite directors? They're going, what should I say? That sounds good, depending on who's asking the question. Yeah. And it's funny when I watch them and I see that they give answers. I say, Fuck off. That's not what you said to me the other week. I can always say straight away, Brian De Palma, John, John Carpenter, um, Walter Hill, Richard Attenborough, um, Michael Mann. Um, those would be like, the immediate five that come to mind oh, for yeah. me. Oh man, that's at least four of my favorites right there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if Tom DeCillo De is is a favorite director of mine, but I love every film that he's done because they're so self-effacing, and it's like the guy's doing a biography of my life. Sometimes scary as that may. Well, um, I, I owe Tom be. my my career as a writer pretty much. You know, he was he was the guy like as I mentioned earlier on Masters of the Universe introduced me to movies. Mm. Tom DeCillo introduced me to cinema. And I don't mean that to sound pretentious, but I mean, I, I discovered Johnny Swade, his first movie. Yeah. When I was about 12 years old, 11 years old, which at that point, you know, I just, I was into horror movies, action movies, Steven Seagal. But then I discovered Johnny Swade one day in a video shop. And I just thought it had a really striking VHS cover. So I took a chance on it. I said, I must try to bring it home. And it was, it blew my mind. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. I'd never it's, seen. It's, it's a great, it's a great film. And and, yeah. and also the one that he then kind of remade the story about with, um, oh God, what's it called? The one with. Um, Living in Oblivion. Living in Oblivion. Yeah. Yeah. His experiences of making that film are all on Living in yeah. Oblivion. And I love the obvious Brad Pitt. Um, yeah. Really? But I mean, it was it was that which blew my mind and kind of introduced me to art cinema and world cinema and the idea of film being something more than entertainment. And, you know, years later, when I, I had a chance to actually contact Tom, I was at a low ebb in my life, I would say. And I really wanted to do something to do with writing f about film or something to do with film. And Tom gave me an opportunity to work with him, spend some time with him working on this book. And it's because of that book that, you know, I'm here now. Um, right. so I, owe, I, owe, I owe Tom so much, not only for his movies, but for his graciousness and willingness to allow me into his world. Well, that's, um, that's you know, it's great to hear. We, we don't get to thank the people that influence, influence us in that way very much. You know, no. um, I, I mean, I, I guess in another way, and I didn't put them on my immediate list, but but... You know, I would love to thank Steven Spielberg and George Lucas one day because they created these amazing worlds that kind of made me realise, like with film, telling any kind of story was uh, was possible. Um, you know, then they went and made Indiana Jones four. <laughs> 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 but um, but you know, I do still love them. I'm a bit yeah. nervous about the new one. Just seen the trailer. Mm. Lots of CGI horses in train tunnels is really not what I want to see in an Indiana Jones film. I want to see stuff that I could believe would really happen yeah. and him just get out in the nick of time, not nonsense. Yeah. But that's a whole I think, that, I think that happens with, you know, artists that we love whenever it's there's something new. We want it, we want it to retain something that was magical about that we first discovered in them years ago. Yeah. And it's, it doesn't always happen, but, you know. Well, I think, you know, everyone's, if you're going to have a successful career and you're going to be able to make a lot of movies, everybody's going to be able to bang a few out. Now, this is your book on Walter Hill, which is a, a very much a kind of blow by blow, blow of, of all of his directorial efforts. Um, yeah. Not everything. He's also, a lot of people don't know that Walter Hill is also a producer. Um, and uh, those cinephiles out there will, will know that his name appears in the credits for Aliens, which, of course, is one of my favorite films of all time. And in fact, I have the Marine Squad here. Look at this in miniature. Ah, oh, nice. And they're still in the box, not because I don't like getting stuff out of the box, because I do, but I want somebody who can paint them to this standard on the <laughs> cover. So and, until I've got a guy who can who can paint them, I've got a box of aliens up there as well, uh, to that standard. I am not unboxing them. Um, no. So we thought it would be fun to um i don't know if you did a top five or a top three but to compare notes on our top top five walter hills have you got a top a five. five i've I'm got a five. top five great okay cool well, that might be a um a good way to start but before we get into that i mean have you met him have you spoken to him yeah i've met walter yeah a couple of times we did we did it over zoom you know oh, so wow. um, that, that was our thing and i'm going to be meeting him next month over in Malibu. I go over to visit some friends and going to be meeting up with Walter. So looking forward to that. 
So Thanks yeah, he's a, he's a he's a wonderful guy. You know, I I've never been I've never been starstruck. I've never been kind of nervous going into an interview, but I think this was the closest I've ever gotten to it because right. Walter has a certain he's a formidable intellect. You know, and yeah. um, he's and not he's a the man's kind of guy man, and he kn he knows his stuff. He knows oh, his stuff. Oh my god, he, he's a film yeah. Apart from being a an amazing filmmaker he's an amazing film historian he just has a great mind for cinema and he knows right. everything so you know me i think and that's where we really connected i think more so than just in the kind of the q a for the book we connected between the between that yeah you know we just had great chats about you know movies we love from the silent era directors oh, we love right. from the 30s and 40s you know so um there was plenty of about, material did you talk about laurel and hardy was he a fan of the black and white Laurel and Hardys by any chance? We never mentioned Laurel and Hardy, but we certainly did go back to some of the, the early silent movies, all right, like D.W. Griffith, you know, Raoul Walsh, people like that. And, you know, it was... Buster, what about Buster Keaton's The General and The Great Dictator and that kind of stuff? Was he a, a fan of all those? He never mentioned it. He never mentioned We never ventured into the, the comedy or the slapstick stuff, you know. He's, well, he's, he's not very big, much into He's not a big comedy director, is he? Let's, 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 let's face he's it. He's not. He can, he can do it well. When he does it, he does it well, but he doesn't do it too often. So we'll... No. Well, I, I, I can say that um, I, I have seen probably about, I'm lucky, I've seen about 80% of his movies at the cinema. Wow. Um, from, uh, it was great. The first film of Walters I ever saw at the cinema, the first film of his I ever saw was The Warriors. Um, but the first film of his I ever saw at the cinema was 48 Hours, and um, which was an 18, right? So I, I didn't get to see it on cinema release in the UK. But fortunately, I was on holiday in Denmark with my dad. And, um, you know, was, we were out in the sticks on the coast and we were there for a, like a month. So, you know, dad said, well, let's go into town and see what films are on because they always show them with, with English subtitles, though, um, and Danish subtitles if it's an English movie. They won't dub it. Um, so I thought, oh, okay, well, I can part with that. So we went, when we got to see a double bill of 48 Hours and um, Under Fire with Nick Nolte, I mean, oh, yeah. talk about two great movies. Yeah. And that was the first time I'd ever seen Eddie Murphy in a, in a, in a, in a film. And um, I, I never forget. Um, we were sitting there waiting for the film to start, and it was a it was a very antiquated small cinema, and there were two plant pots, one either side of the curtain, with one flower coming out in each. And my dad's sitting there, and he goes, "They went all out on the uh, plant decorations, didn't they?" My <laughs> my dad never made any jokes, but God, I'll, I'll never forget that. But he loved both of those movies. So two good after, movies, two very different movies as well. Very different. What I mean, it's a weird double bill, but um, yeah. I think they just used to do that a lot in Denmark with American films. They put one on after the other, and you could pay and go and watch them both, and, and we did. And yeah, um, and yeah, but that was the first film of his that I saw in the cinema. Warriors was the first one I saw, mm. I think, on vi video. What was your first Walter Hill movie? Same as yourself. My first movie would have been Forty Eight Hours, and that would have been on. I remember fairly clearly it was. BBC One, Christmas either 1988 or 89, because I remember that was it was around the year that ET was released again theatrically. There was a whole, and I remember Barry Norman's film, whatever it was, you know, film program that year, and he's doing the countdown, and there was the ad for 48 Hours coming up on afterwards, and I I got my dad to tape it, right. which is how how it kind of got into movies a lot of years ago. Is that my dad would tape movies for me, totally inappropriate movies, you know, Death Wish 2, Halloween 3, all that kind of stuff. But um, which I loved. You know, I wasn't a Disney kid. I was a Canon kid. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no, no, well, kid. yeah. So, um, you know, that was one of the movies that my dad taped for me over Christmas. And I watched it. And it wasn't necessarily the movie that got me into Walter Hill, but it was certainly my first Walter Hill movie. I didn't really get into Walter Hill until a few years later when somebody, I think it was my brother-in-law, suggested that I go back and watch Southern Comfort, which was a movie I remember right. the, the cover of in the VHS shops, but I never just never it was never inclined to rent it so i did go back and watch southern comfort and it just blew my mind it was just yeah. oh absolute yeah. brilliant brilliant film masterpiece and it's um yeah it shook me to my core that film because it's so intense 
Well, it's so well, unrelenting. I have a feeling this one's going to be in your top five. It'll be in interesting to compare lists in in a, in a sec. Would you, I, would you believe? Well, we'll wait till the list. But let's um, wait, yeah, don't say, don't say. Okay. But um, uh, funnily enough, what, what once I saw the Warriors, the reason that because I would always look to see who the directors were because I wanted to see their other movies, and the reason that then I rented this out was because you know you go down, you chat with the guy behind the counter. Uh, which, by the way, in the 80s was me because I did a Tarantino and, and worked behind the counter of two different video shops. And, and um, But in the early 80s, I didn't do that until, like, I think I did that in the, from 87 to, like, 91 or something. Um, but, but between sort of 80 and 84, that's yeah. when we were renting everything or, or up to maybe 86. And that's also when all the Italian B-movie invasion all came over, all yeah. their Mad Max rip-offs and stuff. Yeah. But this is one of the ones... We, yeah, this was one of the ones we got out that was. I think it was an. I think it was an eighteen. I think it was an X when it was released on VHS. I it was, it was yeah, because I have the original uh, VHS here somewhere. Yeah. It, was, it was an eighteen and an X. So that was one of the ones where we had to go down and sort of, you know, talk in deep voices and go, um, "Yes, uh, Southern Comfort, please. How old yep. are you? You know that kind of thing." I think the owner knew we were probably not, but. Um, my Paul, who had the video recorder, this lad at school that I befriended, who I was around his house every Saturday watching like two, three films. Yeah. Um, bless him. And his mum used to cook us these amazing meals with chips and beans, all very unhealthy, but lovely stuff that I didn't get yeah. from my parents. But wasn't um, that the great thing about the VHS era, though? That like, oh. you, you spent your money and you had to watch that movie to get your money's worth. And you sat through it and you watched the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and exactly. you might even go back a second time just to be sure because it's not... Oh, like if it was way. good, you do, you just, as a kid, if it was good, it was like, let's watch it again, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah, it's not like now, with, you know, Netflix minutes, or whatever. Going, if you don't like the, the first five minutes of a movie, now you switch it off, you go to the next one, you know? But back then, yeah. you, you actually spent time. You gave a movie that respect. You, you paid your pound for it. You're going to yeah. watch it. You know, well, everything now is this is what I, I was saying to Matthew Holmes the other day, who's a film director, a friend of mine. He's um, just done a uh, he's done a couple of westerns, and you should check out his films. I'm sure you'd like them. And uh, um, you know, I thought I had to remind him the other day. You know, don't forget, not everyone's going to watch your film the way that we want them to watch it. Yeah. Um, it's the same with my film, The Journey. I in, in the end, I, we had a lot of problems with the release that I won't bore you with. And eventually we I just put it on YouTube and just said it's on my channel. People can watch it because I've, I've had it for God knows how long. And, um, you know, and Critical Drinker, bless him, did a shout out for it. And suddenly the views on it just went from a thousand. I think there's nearly two and a half thousand now. But I can see by the watch hours that only about of those fifteen hundred people, I think only about three hundred of them have watched the whole movie. Wow. It's a two-hour movie, so I can because I can tell from the watch hours that have gone up. So, yeah. um, bless them, a load of them obviously started watching it, and it's quite a cerebral film. There's there's yeah. not a lot of action in it. There's a little bit, but not a lot. Um, so it's not going to be for most people. It's a film about yeah. bereavement. You know, it's pretty. Yeah. So people don't get to you know people don't turn the lights off and turn their phones off and watch no. it all in one go like we hope they will. But that they don't have that kind of level of investment because I guess when no. something's perceivable to have been free such as YouTube, you know, even though we pay our Wi-Fi bills or whatever, yeah. you're not paying, you're not, you're not paying your pound over the counter to take this tangible no. thing home, put it in the machine and sit there and watch it. And, you know, okay. Some movies, they might start off great, but because we gave them those, that time back then you sat with it and you might've come to the end of it and go, that was a great film, even though it started off a bit slow or whatever, you know, I miss those days. Those to me were, my favorite era of movie watching because yeah you're, you're kind of indiscriminate you know you kind of go into a video shop you see a cover that looked interested like me with johnny suede and you picked it up just because there was a cool image on the on the cover you know and you took a chance yeah well i mean that was the funny thing about those italian movies wasn't it they always employed really good artists yeah. to give you these very exciting covers with exploding cars and a guy with a big gun <laughs> and there'd be some chicks and you know, yeah. there'd be a, a cityscape behind it, some kind of sci-fi thing. Yeah. And, it's like the yeah. Bronx Warriors could never live up to its cover image. Dude, I've got the I've got the the silver box um, set of that Bronx Warriors, <laughs> Bronx Warriors Two, and the New Brilliant. Barbarians in the other room. Oh, fantastic! Um, they are great, but they could never live up to their covers. <laughs> and, and there's a there's a guy on my um, friends list on Facebook who I think's done a a book on all those movies. Oh, wow. Um, I think it's called like the, the movies of the wasteland or something like that. I can't remember Ooh. exactly, but um, 
yeah 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 i mean it, it you know and uh i've got to get a copy of it but that that would be a great thing to do another stream about um those kinds of films from that era because there are so many of them and some of them are actually not bad i really some... enjoy them you know when you take them yeah. in the context of what they are yeah fun you know and you miss there's a certain grittiness to those low budget movies that you don't get in low budget movies today which i think look no, I too clean. they look and they're, they're a master class in filmmaking as well the way that they you know make six people look like 60 and, and yeah. they did that with the bronx for is they they'd they do a scroll from left to right and then they do a wipe and then yeah. they move everybody and put them over to the right and then they carry put a on different jacket on them <laughs> yeah and slightly different put switch the helmets around on a few guys and they so they'd make the sort of you know six buggies that they had look like 20 and yeah i, I love all that well look let's let's start with our our top five um okay. so you're my guest so i'm gonna let you go first what's 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 in fifth place for you okay in fifth place for me is streets of fire ah well that's interesting uh that might be on my list but it's not in fifth place now um every time you say one that i've got the soundtrack of i'm gonna bring it up and here it oh, is oh and that's one of the reasons i love it so much is that bloody soundtrack it's amazing i mean the 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 opening and closing um songs tonight is what it means to be young and nowhere really? fast are amazing songs why tonight is what it means to be young wasn't like a worldwide number one i know i don't know but i feel like when we want to upset simon cowell again maybe you and i should join forces with some other people and <laughs> we should try and get that song to number one because it's, it's an amazing one. song isn't it, it? it's just it's it's like a timeless it's done by i think it's rick steinman who did meatloaf's stuff and yeah. um it, yeah uh, uh and i really like this this it has movie. that kind of uh the wagnerian rock opera kind of thing going on where it's just this kind of wall of sound and it's, it's incredible it's very very bombastic or whatever but it just suits the film perfectly and i love the way it's shot and i, I spoke about this to walter in, in the book um you know where those scenes, those concert scenes are shot as if they were like a music video for MTV. And of yeah. course, this, this had just kind of predated MTV by about a year or so. And Walter said he had never seen a music video in his life. But, you know, he's working with Freeman Davies and these other editors who were just ingenious. And, you know, they're, they're always brilliant when they're working with Walter. But they really, really developed a style on that film, which yeah. became, I think, part of the MT MTV style of filmmaking. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. It's and it's the, the colors on it really pop, you oh. know, the neon lights reflecting in the water, all of that, which is very sort of iconic Walter Hill imagery, yeah. even in you know 48 hours and um, some of those movies, you've got those kinds of those kinds of images. Um, yeah. I love Streets of Fire. I mean, you know, Diane Lane's dress may be a factor. Um, Oh, we've got Mr. Brown Alliance uh, in the. Well, in you know, stream. I was actually, I'm actually more of an Amy Madigan fan. I think of the two two ladies in that. I, I think oh, I, I probably Madigan. had a bit more of a crush on Amy Madigan, but there you go. <laughs> I've seen um, Amy Madigan on stage, and because I, I think she's married to Ed Harris, if I remember rightly. That's right. And they did a play together in London, and it, and I mean, it's a really heavy play involving the the hiding of a death of a child and all of this kind of stuff in kind of the American Midwest, really heavy issues. Right. And we went to see it on like the 23rd of December or something <laughs> like that. And um, I remember Ed Harris kind of like putting on a Santa hat as they did the bow and went, Merry fucking Christmas, <laughs> because he knew it, the play was so bleak. It's like, and he, you could see he was standing on stage thinking, why are people coming to see this? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, for Christmas. Oh, well, it's because you and Amy Madigan are in it and we want to yeah. see you on stage. And they were, yeah. they oh, were they're, phenomenal. They are incredible actors. I was only watching Ed Harris again recently um, in The Abyss, which I hadn't seen in a long time, but I was researching for a book I'm working on, another book, and I went back to The Abyss and Jesus, he is incredible in that film. It's, it's, not, it's not my favourite film of all time. It's not even one of my favourite James Cameron movies, but he is super. Are you, are you watching the director's cut, which is a very different movie? I did watch both. Yeah. But, um, I, I, for some reason, I, I have a soft spot for the theatrical version, probably because it's the one I kind of grew up with. The first VHS release, the first showings on Sky when it started in 1989, 1990 was all that version. So oh, the opening night, Odie and Leicester Square, 70 millimeter print. It took 12 wow. people to see it for my birthday. Um, oh. That was my birthday movie that year. And uh, yeah, it was 
Yeah, incredible movie on, on a big screen. Yeah, it was. It was. I mean, it was. It was good. I was disappointed in it. I'll be honest. I actually read the novelization first. I think Orson Scott Card did it. And um, right. What 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 book's that for? Before we move on, it's a book I'm working on with my friend Amanda Kramer, who I just did the Hired Guns book with, the music book, Portraits oh, yeah. of Women in Alternative Music. We're working on another book now on soundtracks and film sound from 1960 to 1990. So the development of film music through the new Hollywood and through the MTV era, and talking about you know the you know the introduction more of of music supervisors over composers. And so a friend of Amanda's, uh, Blake Lay, had worked prolifically in that era as a sound uh, music supervisor, sound designer, composer. So one of the things he worked on and won awards for was The Abyss. That's interesting. I have to say that I'm not a fan of the direction that soundtracks have taken where they've, for certainly for a lot of the big movies and the recent June movie, which I do like, um, mm. is a good example of this, is they've moved more into where you can't really tell where the soundtrack begins and the sound design ends. And I actually, I got to meet Dennis, Dennis Villeneuve and I asked him that question. I said, was that your intention? And he said, no, absolutely. That was the, that was the, the feel. I, I wanted it to feel totally alien. So you couldn't tell what right. was music and what wasn't. Okay, fair enough. I get that. Yeah. But I love the June soundtrack to the David Lynch thing. And I can remember all the different sure. themes from that. Yeah. All I can remember from the, the new June movie was... So that I mean that you know I, yeah. I, I'm a traditionalist when it comes to I'm the same yeah it, it feels often today like it's a bit of a cacophony of sound yeah and music so it's yeah it's not really something I'm terribly well, interested in these days. My number five spot just coming to mind so so we we have time to do all of these because uh, you and I are going to go off on all sorts of tangents. <laughs> um, I was I was torn. It was between Last Man Standing and Red Heat, but I think. I probably got a softer spot for Last Man Standing. I think mainly because Christopher Walken's in it. I rewatched Red Heat recently, which actually gets mentioned in my new book, which is coming out called 1988. I'm gonna um, send you a copy of that. Oh, please! Uh, I think I can get a load of author copies uh, relatively cheaply. Um, but it's it's about my first year in America. But it, it reviews every film I saw that year, and Red Heat oh. was one of them. Oh. Um, and uh, I also have the Red Heat soundtrack on Vine. Oh, James Horner. Yeah, oh, but he's my favourite composer, even though he could be lazy at times, but... Uh, yes, he, 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 he had he, a tendency to repeat himself a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, the Willow soundtrack and the, the Enemy at the Gates, there's pretty much no difference between the two of them, which is yeah. a bit of a shame, you know? But, um, but uh, no, that is a terrific soundtrack, Red Heat. Yeah, I mean, Red Heat's a great soundtrack. Last Man Standing um, has not got a bad one either, but I don't, I don't have that. I think Red Heat is probably the more rewatchable of the two, but I think Last Man Standing is maybe is just slightly a better film overall, technically. Um, uh, you know, well, but that, that I'd probably give it to Last Man Standing. I was kind yeah. of up in the air between the two of those. All right. Well, I'll give you my uh, thoughts on Last Man Standing in a few minutes for sure. Oh, cool. Um, All right. Well, Red, I, I, now I, saw, I saw both of those at the cinema as well. And I saw Last Man Standing in a very small screen. And, and there was only about me and three other people there. It well, that was one of the, the great shames of Walter's career is how New Line mismarketed and you know didn't bother really with Last Man Standing. You know, and... As I say, I'll get into it a bit in a bit more detail in a few minutes, but I think um, it de certainly deserved a hell of a lot more attention when yeah. it came out. You know, and um, Red Heat, I think, is a fabulous entertainment. And again, it was one of my earliest uh, Walter Hill. Actually, that was the movie where I started to take notice of the name Walter Hill. You know, Why? when you become kind of cognizant of when you're watching movies and you see a Walter Hill film. You start yeah. to notice the authors of these movies. And I think it was Red Heat was the one for me where I started to think, hmm, Walter Hill, I'll look up what else he did. And then you discover, oh, he did 48 Hours. He did Crossroads. He did whatever else. And you start to go, okay, I'm going to start buying these movies or renting these movies. So I have a great affection for Red Heat. And plus, I just, I think it's, it's as I say, it's just a great entertainment. It's one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's best movies of that whole yeah. prolific period of his in the 80s. I love it's grittiness you know there's a certain grounded grittiness to that films which weren't in the likes of commando or red heat certainly if, you know, no it, it, the, the gunfights and things in red heat uh, they're they're a lot more 
realistic. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's Walter. Walter's, you know, he's he's a he's a stickler for those kind of um, really well well crafted gunfights and action sequences. And of course, they can they can turn into completely huge set pieces, as we know, like with um, Alan Graff with his bus yeah. ride through downtown Chicago, you know, which is, is just a completely bombastic action set piece. Were brilliantly so. And, um, yeah. But there's just something about Red Heat. I mean, I'm not I'm not the biggest James Belushi fan in the world, but he's fantastic in this. He's perfect foil for Schwarzenegger. Yeah, and he was a very difficult man to work with in that era, in particular, for reasons that we won't get into. But um, sure. I, I, yeah, I really enjoyed Red Heat. Um, it was so annoying when I saw it at the cinema that the the projector went wrong halfway through one of the action scenes and didn't get oh, no. corrected until the action sequence had had finished with the clean heads when they. Um, rob the guys and uh, they're pretending to be security guards and they get smashed over and he's trying to get the key and all that stuff oh yeah that, that whole sequence got completely ruined which was so oh. annoying um i did have an original cinema quad for red heat as well i'm not sure if i still got it i might still have it um but um yeah i mean it it, it, it i think it, it's really re it, that's a good one that you can re-watch with almost anybody whereas dead man standing is not going to be maybe everyone's cup of tea um, no it's a bit more uh r r r it's r very r bleak it's very bleak and, and the story is quite thin i think one of the things that's so impressive about red heat though is the fact that walter hill you know did a big shoot in russia he got to film in red square yeah um, and I, I read about, i read up on how they did Ooh. that and and of course you you um, talk about it as well um that in 1988, I think they shot shot it in 87. That's amazing because that's like at the height of the Cold War. Yep. You know, we're not quite in Glasnost yet. The, I don't think the Berlin Wall had, um, had come down. And uh, but you can you can you can imagine the meeting where you know you, the, the, the guys are sort of looking through the script and going, "Oh, this is a story about a, a really good Russian policeman who kind of makes the Americans look a bit crap." Yes, we'll yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll let you we'll let. You. <laughs> Arnold's playing the hero. He's playing a Russian. Great. We kind of like this. So yeah. I, I could I can imagine that that would have been um, really funny to see. Yeah, I love what Walter was um, talking about, you know, how the, the security forces over in, in Russia would kind of give him a bit of stick, you know, because they obviously they knew he was a big movie star or whatever. And they were still trying to be kind of stoic or whatever. But, you know, they had to get a had to get a jelly bin at, at Schwarzenegger. <laughs> but, so um so what's your what was your number four my number four is another 48 hours and now i think that, that's interesting man because i'm not a fan of that film few people are <laughs> yeah and i will say i do i for me it's a superior film to 48 hours i think it everything that's great about 48 hours is just amplified in this film and you'll know from talking to Alan Graff that it was a groundbreaking yeah. movie for stunts in American action cinema in the eighties. Um, it I just it was, and and can I just give Alan a, a shout out by the way for saying, "Hey, you've got to talk to Wayne." And I said, and when he told me what you'd done, I looked you up, and I said, "I'll do better than talk to him. I'll get him to come on and plug his book." <laughs> and here um, I am. So, yeah, Thanks, I mean, Alan. I don't know why I didn't like it, but no, go on, you you tell me why why it's on your list. Well. Several reasons, um, aesthetically speaking, I think it's one of Walter's most beautifully shot movies. You know, Matthew Leonetti did a superb job. I don't know what it is. He he captures the kind of dusty, sweltering Californian sunshine vibe exquisitely. And Rick Waite, who was fantastic as well, you know, who did the first 48 hours, his photography is amazing. But there's something about the look and the feel of another 48 hours. Like Matthew, I remember there used to be these little kind of stylistic things in the cinematography that i used to, used to used to fascinate me and i asked matt julie and eddie about it like for example in some of the nighttime scenes you know downtown san francisco you'll just yeah. see these shafts of light in the background and they're purely there for aesthetic reasons no other reasons and i asked matthew about these and i said what was your thinking about about these little things he said listen it was the kind of situation where if i said i want to put a big you know aircraft jumbo jet light in the background i could so I did. Right. <laughs> you know, right. just little flourishes like that. But they all add up. You see that that image there and there with the, the opening scene, which to me is a very much like a Sergio Leone build up. I know. I mean, that could be at, that it could be at the June movie, you know. Exactly. Yeah. It's just it gives you that kind of sweltering, overpowering kind of desert feeling. Um, I love the music in it. I think it's fantastic. I think 
the comedy is a little bit heightened more so than the the first 48 hours but it's offset by the by the action the action is so i wouldn't say over the top because i don't mean it to be a pejorative but it's so no everything is brought up to a heightened level of action that i would say has come to define the walter hill style and i i i would credit alan graff with with that because he was the stunt coordinator yeah. he was the second unit director so he directed a lot of those action sequences and i'm sure he probably when he was talking to you you went into detail about how he did certain things you know yeah we, we 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 covered a lot of that stuff i mean he's a great he was a great guest it was so nice of him to come on he didn't know me from adam um yeah. but he could tell i i knew my stuff and yeah. um actually like, we talked about edo ross funnily enough who's in this uh shot who's a character actor that i love i think he's great yeah. Fantastic actor. And I mean, in this film, it's it started a kind of a trend in Walter Hill movies. Again, it's probably Alan, but if someone gets shot, they don't just get shot. It's like as if they get shot by a cannon. You know? Oh, I mean, the, 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 the big bat, the big sort of pushback. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just, everything is just so heightened. You know, everything that you love about 48 hours just goes that one notch higher. You know, it goes to 11, as they say, in another 48 hours. And I think it's such an underrated movie. And one of the cool things about talking to Walter was I think he, he quickly realized that I love all of his movies, but I particularly love some of the ones that have been unappreciated or underappreciated down the years. And he was right. very happy to hear that, you know, because when he heard that I loved another 48 hours as much as I do last man standing as much as I do, et cetera. He was like, he was so happy to hear that because for years they're kind of written off as oh, Walter Hill failure or whatever the bad at the box office. I mean, look at that stunt for God's sake. Yeah, that's really I mean, now that, really that's uh, that, that stunt, I believe, is in the Guinness World Book of Records, and that's Alan Graf, who we interviewed yeah. inside that vehicle, and he's got a framed photograph of, of it, yeah. of course. In Absolutely. I'm so happy to get that image in the book as well, because I know Alan yeah. was keen to get it in, and, you know, it's... Well, he, I, he did a fantastic um, forward for you for that book. I thought it was well, great. I couldn't think of anybody more appropriate because alan apart from the fact that he's worked on so many of walter's movies in front of the camera behind the camera he's just there's a certain friendship and brotherhood between the two of them yeah you can yeah you can sense that yeah alan could give me a kind of a personal insight that maybe others couldn't you know many others could give me a professional insight whatever but alan gives me both and alan's just a just a lovely guy you know i enjoy our he's been a good friend i enjoy our chats Ever yeah. since we we finished the book, we we've, we've had a few co- phone calls and are hoping to catch up at some stage when I get to America. But you know, he's just a wonderful guy, and I'm sure you you feel the same. But when you look oh, at Alan Graff, there's a I, whole history of your relationship to cinema because of him, because of his face. I'm you can sure recall... this isn't a relative of yours, uh, but uh, they're waving at you, just so you know. <laughs> Mr. No, Burns. sorry. Continue, continue. But yeah, no, I was just um, saying that you know, Alan comes with a whole history of cinema yeah, with him. you know what I mean? whether it's the paul verhoeven movies or yeah. any number of action movies sports movies friday night here. lights all, all of his american football choreography i mean and and um you know uh, 222 movies i mean very yeah. few people have that many imdb credits nor throughout those those many decades as well i mean Absolutely. you know from the 70s right through to the present day and he's still working yeah. And I have doing... to say, when I was sitting there talking to Alan, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is that guy from the A-team, from TJ Hooker, from... Yeah. You, you yeah, name it. He, he's that guy in the bar. He's that, he's that, he's that portly henchman. That, and there he, were three or four actors that always played those roles who kind of bought, sort of trod that border yeah. between stuntman and actor. They would do small acting parts and they looked mean. And Yeah. So, you know, Alan comes with his own his own history, apart from his history with Walter. So uh, I was so happy to get him to do the forward and just to get to know him. Yeah. You might have to do an Alan Graff book, you know. There is a book there, trust me. There is a book there. Or, or I mean, maybe a stunt, you know, sort of the, the top five Hollywood stuntmen still living. Yeah, today well, a few, a few of those guys have done them. I mean, Vic Armstrong. Yeah. Did more I've, a few I've, years ago. So I have his and I was at the book signing of it at Forbidden Planet. Um, oh, wow. But I, it's it's not it's. I think he should have had somebody write it with him. It it, it felt a little bit dry. Yeah, for me. For me. Um, yeah. But but it was great to meet him, and it was great to read about how they did Bridge Too Far and what one of my favorite films. And you know, yeah. Corey and did, um, in Car Rough, Park, Rough Cut with Burke Reynolds. Right. Yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's he's again. He's another one who's you know straddled a great many. Okay. Well, look. 
let, let's uh, I, I, let, oh, I'm conscious of the time, so let, let's uh, race race through to the next. Uh, my next, my number four, <laughs> and it's another one I've got uh, the soundtrack for behind me, and at, of all the Walter Hill soundtracks, it's my favourite. So can you guess what it is on that basis? Mm. Mm. Good Walter Hill soundtrack. I'm going to have Good to say one. Southern Comforts or... Uh, it's not Southern Comfort. It is, in fact... Uh, so my number four choice, where is it now? Are we on director credits? No, we're on producer credits. No wonder I can't find it. Let's get, let's get the director credits up. Um, Long Riders? Yeah. No, I love that movie, by the way. I've got that on uh, DVD. I haven't got it on Blu-ray yet. My number four choice is Extreme Prejudice. I ah. saw this at the cinema. Not a lot of people have seen it. Um, well, you know I what? Love... That's, that's my number three as well, so we can talk about it together. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, well, let's talk about it in unison there. So, yeah, so my number four choice, um, Wayne's number three choice. Uh, here's the soundtrack. Uh, this was an import as well from 58 Dean Street Records, which back in the 80s and up to about the mid-90s was the shop that you went to get your imported soundtracks from. And I would always pop in there to see what they have. And um, I remember going up to see this movie right after I broke up uh, with my very first girlfriend, with my friend Martin. And we were looking at what was on. And um, that was, I think there were only two new films that came out that week. And this was one of them. And Martin said, oh, I've heard that's not very good. And I said, no, no, that's it's directed by Walter Hill. And um, Barry Norman said it's a homage to The Wild Bunch. So it's, it can't be that bad. Exactly. So we went and watched it. And I mean, you know, like Walter Hill says about his movies, every movie's a Western. Certainly every movie of his is a Western. And um this one was very great. It's not a man's world. The the woman is there to be kind of talked down to. And that's not to say that the, that's what I want from every movie. But this was a brutal film about brutal men doing brutal things to each other, double crossing. And the fact that it's got several of my all-time favourite character actors in it, Clancy Brown, Michael Ironside, who I've I followed his career since Space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, let yeah. alone Top Gun. Um, you know, uh, William Forsyth, Alonso is the the token woman. She's very good. Um, yeah, great, great film. I love it. Love the the battle scene at the end. Amazing choreography. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a perfect movie or anything. It's just a good, really gritty action film. And the trailer for it's fantastic as well. I love the trailer. You know, they yeah. were a phantom army that didn't. You know, and all this kind of thing. It's, it's also. One of my favorite opening credit sequences of any Walter Hill film because just the way they introduce yeah. each character with their passport and their yes! military background and stuff like that, and that music, yeah, superb, you know. But um, it's interesting because so much analysis of the film down the years has mentioned and the reviews that it is kind of a a wild bunch homage. And I brought this up to Walter, and he kind of he kind of suggested it wasn't, but you know, I still had to follow through on it in my analysis of the film myself, because to me, I love the wild bunch. So it's a film I'm, I'm quite intimate with. And I, you can see many parallels between the two yeah, films, especially uh, in this picture. Yeah. I mean, as Walter said, you know, it's become so iconic, the wild bunch that any Western that has a showdown in a Mexican plaza and loads of people get killed is going to feel like a, an homage to the wild bunch. But I think there's too many, too many parallels here to to say it's it's not related somehow thematically because i mean you have the, the two characters who are former friends who are now on the opposite side of the law they're you know they're, they're foes they're going toe to toe they have this great showdown and then you have the gang around them as well which are all very yeah. similar characters to the characters of the wild bunch but it was interesting that walter kind of was kind of uh, i don't think it's it's an obvious one or a deliberate one but you know he walters said you're the writer wayne you write what you want to write so it's your book. So I did continue with my analogy, you know, with the Wild Bunch, but, uh, you know. Josh, Joshua is saying he hasn't seen this movie. I'm telling you now, Josh, this is a film you must watch. In fact, any of these movies that are in mine or Wayne's top five, you've got to watch. He's, he's a young wee whippersnapper who was brought up on the Star Wars prequels, bless him, <laughs> and um, for his sins. And I'm constantly trying to get him to watch good old movies and he hasn't got time because he's too busy watching Marvel. So, oh, okay, um, okay. 
Uh, go um, there. <laughs> no, exactly. But I want to give Rick Torn a shout out because the partnership between them, they've only got a couple of scenes together, but they do that thing. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. That, that kind of that banter that they've got, like they've done yeah. this a million times. And um, I could have watched a TV series about the two of them if they'd yeah. spun it off. Oh, that, totally, it, yeah. It, it would yeah. have been it would have been really good fun, you know, to go. Oh, to the two like grizzled the... old small town yeah. detectives or whatever they are. Fantastic byplay between them, and you know they're two, as Alan Graff would say, men's men. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But it's 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 incredible. I mean, I some of my friends worked on it. You know, there were cinematographers, cameramen. You know, Michael D. O'Shea, Bobby LeBong. Big shout out to them. Right. Just, I got incredible insights from them just on how Walter works. I mean, if you read the chapter on Extreme Prejudice in the book, they talk about how uh, Mike and Bobby both made a mistake in shooting the scene where Rip Torn gets killed. They just it was it was a practical mistake. They didn't catch him going down when he was getting shot. And both of them feared, oh, God, cinematographer Matthew Leonetti, he's going to tear us a new one. And then Walter's going to tear us a new one. <laughs> you know, so they eventually had to tell him nobody, none of the camera guys got the shot. He just fell out of frame too quick or whatever it was. So right. eventually Walter came over, Matthew, get the shot. Matthew says, unfortunately, the guys didn't catch it. And it would take far too long and it would be time consuming and annoying on Rip to, you know, set him up again with all those squibs and to shoot it again. So Walter said, listen, Freeman, the editor, he'll sort it out. He'll, he'll work with what you got. He'll have the scene. And of course, that's what's in the movie. And that's, right. that, that was testament to how easygoing and adaptable Walter is as a filmmaker, that he trusts his crew members and their, the craftsmen, that they'll, they'll find it, they'll fix it. I mean, Alan Graff said when we were interviewing him, I and mean, then, by the way, when you pop over and see Walter, like tell him I would love him to come on my channel if he's up for it. Um, <laughs> I really, it I really, really would. And you can tell I'm a super fan. Um, Alan Graff said, and I love this about him, he really cares about his crew. And that was why he had that massive tarpaulin built over the set of Streets of Fire, the one oh, that yeah. blew away at one point, so that they could shoot all the night stuff they had to shoot, which was about 60% of the film during the day. And it, it's funny, I went back and re-watched it and I could see that a, apart from when they went out to that factory location, which was probably like, what, you know, two or three days of night shooting or something, that was probably the only night shooting that they had to do. And you can you can kind of see how the framing of it is, you know, it's it's all very kind of under yeah. the railway tracks and that kind of thing. It's It's very, very clever. So it's nice to hear that about him. I don't know if you know, by the way, but I think I read that, Tom Lister Jr., who's in this photograph on the left, I think he he died of um, COVID in the early uh, the first year of the pandemic, I believe. Ah, oh, I knew he had passed away. I didn't realize it was COVID. I think it. I I, I might. Be, I don't. I mean, we might. I'll, I'll check after the stream. But yeah, yeah. And, and and he, he was in a couple of Walter's movies. You know, he gr a great right. physical presence, and I always remember him from there was a, a quite terrible WWF movie back in about 1988, 89 called No Holds Barred, with Hulk Hogan and himself. Right. And just it's, it it might as well have been you know a, a canon movie at their worst it was it was horrendous but that, that was my first tiny lister experience <laughs> I, I i did meet um oh god i forget his name now the the wwf guy that was in they live he he he, he actually released a single and he came to oh, the roddy, roddy piper roddy piper he came to the store that i was working at and i have a picture of me and him together from an insta uh, camera and oh, he also really? signed my they live vinyl soundtrack Ah, what um, a soundtrack. And it, it was so funny because they bought him all this food to have in like the green room. They bought him all this salad and all this healthy stuff and everything. And I remember coming back up there after he'd left and he hadn't touched a thing. <laughs> um, didn't eat any of it. So we all kind of got to eat that. But he was very, he was a very pleasant guy. Maybe he really there. secretly wanted like a Burger King or something rather than healthy uh, food. Yeah, <laughs> quite possibly. It was a shame he passed away so young. I mean, for anyone who hasn't seen Extreme Prejudice, which is my number four, Wayne's number three, in our top five Water Hill films, seriously check it out. It's worth buying the Blu-ray, um, which has got a lot of extra features on it. It's a proper old school action film with really good action and some impressive beards and haircuts. Yeah. Uh, and you know the way movie. Walter Hill says every movie he makes is a western. This is the probably the most classic example of it. It's not yeah. gen generically speaking a western, but it's a western in every other respect. 
I love this actor. Isn't this the guy? You're going to know this. Isn't this the guy that says to Commander Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger and Commando, "So you better cooperate, right? Wrong, Wrong. bang!" <laughs> and that's one of the best scenes in a movie ever because you would never expect. That's like the the kidnappers scene in every movie. Where that's right. He's, he's sitting there with like the love heart cards that his daughter he, made. Yeah, it's blown away. Yeah. And he just kills him. And um, uh, yeah, I don't know if he's still going, Gary Carlos uh, Chavente's, yeah. but he, he's, one, he's, of those, he's one of those great faces that just appears throughout, you know, 80s yeah. and 90s cinema. And he's been in a couple of, I think he's been in a couple of Walter Hill movies. Um, yeah. I think, I think, I think he's been, okay. So Extreme Prejudice was our sort of both on our list. So that, well, actually that's for me to do my number three then. Um, my number three is, ah, oh, no, this one, I'd be interested to know whether this was, um, I think I think probably of, of all of his films, I would say that, that this Walter Hill movie is his most kind of, it's the one that he probably should have won awards for in the traditional cinema mm. circles. Can you guess which one I'm going to say? Geronimo. Yeah. Uh, that's my number three choice. Um, I think it's a it's a it's a great film. It's probably his least by the numbers in terms of the script, in terms of the you know the three act setting and everything. Uh, I like my true story western stuff. Yeah. I, I I like anything to do with this is what really happened to the Indians. Yeah. This is how we really treated them. I think this came out not that long after Dances with Wolves, which was nineteen ninety two. There was that. It's that's Infra right. It's, it's it's really because of you know the success of Dances yeah. with Wolves and Unforgiven as well that Sony you know were able to greenlight a film like this, an ambitious film, which really, as you say, Walter wanted to tell the truth and make it a film of verisimilitude and a very sober film. And um, yeah, I spoke, I spoke to Neil Canton, who I was introduced to, thanks to my great friend David McGifford, who I believe is, is joining us here tonight. Um, ah. David David introduced me to Neil Canton, who you, his name you might be familiar from Back to the Future, you know. And there's David there; he's popping up. But yeah. David introduced me to Neil, and Neil Neil's um, brother was, I think, the head of production at Sony at the time, Columbia. And it was him that you know greenlit the film or whatever. And you know they both spoke spoke to me about the, the making of the film, getting it into production, and you know not not a commercial film by any means. You know, it's a beautiful, well made no. film, but. Yeah, it's not. It's not a. It's not a, an elegic western in the sense of Dances with Wolves or Unforgiven. I mean, it's very serious, very somber, and quite bleak and violent, but beautifully yeah. made. I mean, it's yeah. Walter. It's Walter reining in some of his maybe the the excesses of his style to just present a film. That yeah, is objectively beautiful and well told. Yeah, when people are shot, I mean, they fall down, but they don't go flying backwards twenty feet in this movie. Exactly. <laughs> um, and um, no, it is. It's. It's. Listen. It's. I mean, you can see from that what a beautiful shot that is, and um, you know, and it is very much about the dying of the old west and the, the, the yeah. you know, the last. It's really the story about the last American Indian who stood up to the expansion of, you know, the United States and 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 the the. The, the attacks of the u.s cavalry and um yeah. you know um and it, i mean another thing about it is it's got a fantastic cast and west studio had just come off of last of the mohicans and yeah. before that he was relatively unknown and then everyone's like god who is this guy because he's one of those actors you can't take your eyes off him when he's he on screen incredible and i think it also has one of my favorite scenes of any of walter's whole career which is robert duvall's death scene which is yeah that's a uh, spoiler so, alert for anyone who hasn't seen it but yeah oops. yeah that that is a pretty horrendous uh uh very yeah. moving moment um, yeah and again the way walter tells the making of that and as neil did you know where it was perfect on take one but they're like what are we going to do if there's something wrong with the film or something goes wrong in the lab surely we have to get take two just in case yeah, Walter was a little reticent in getting Bob to do it again because you know he's just after giving you the performance of a lifetime. How do you say, give me that again? <laughs> but Robert, well, just, the, the one more for is. safety, one more for safety, please. That's 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 the line on set. Yeah, you know? and he did it, but they still used the first take, and that's what's in the movie, and it is right. an incredible piece of film acting. I mean, my favorite actor of all time, and and I wrote to him to tell him that, um, including. 
two letters, one to his agent and one to his wife's furniture store, just in case <laughs> his agent didn't pass it on. He'd retired by then, but Gene Hackman is my favourite actor oh. of all time. Yeah. There's a great shot of water there. Yeah. Um, and um, you've also got uh, a young Matt Damon in this movie. I mean, a, a Western's not a rest Western unless Robert DeVale's in it, let's face it. So, <laughs> um, you know, and it was great series yeah. behind And I think an unsung that. actor in there as well, among all the, the legendary names, is Kevin Ty. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, a, a formidable presence, but usually unsung because he's not necessarily a familiar name, but definitely a familiar face. In he in has other... been in. Um, it's funny because I, oh, you're probably correct, but I always pronounced his name Kevin Teague. I um, could be wrong. Sure. I've never actually heard anybody pronounce it, so I'm just guessing. <laughs> Listen, dude, uh, you could you could be correct. I I really I, this is an actor I really rate. I know my character actors, and he's been around a long time. Let's just see how many yeah. credits he has. On ninety one as an actor, I thought actually he would have more, but yeah. um yeah, Law and Order probably was the last thing I saw him on. I remember him in the forty four hundred as well. I, I really rate Kevin Teague or Ty. Uh, if anybody in the chat knows, uh, please uh, let us know. Um, spell it phonetically so we know. Uh, David has just said, um, Geronimo, a whole no holds barred film, starkly mounted to match its history. That's yeah. very well put, sir. I couldn't have Absolutely. put it better myself. Yeah, let me just say that David McGifford has just released an amazing book, probably my favorite film book of the last few years. David McGifford was the assistant director on many, many great movies. Look him up. He's fantastic. Um, you should get him on. David, what, terrific story David if you want to come on, mate, I would love to interview you because I do industry interviews and I, wherever people are in the industry, uh, if they've got an interesting career, I, I would love to have you on, David. And if, you, if yeah. you've got a book to promote, even better, because if, you, if I can do something to uh, promote your uh, book, then yeah, please come on. So second unit and assistant director on yeah. many of my favorite films. Yeah. And David, um, you know, it, I always say the best thing about writing books is the people you meet. And I met David through the book I did with Nick McLean. They went to high school together. They both worked in the industry, but their, their paths never crossed professionally. But a prime example of why I do this, the people you meet and the friends you make is just incredible. And I love wow. you, David. Well, David, I've even seen Empire of the Ants. So, uh, you know, you got to come on and talk to me about that. Um, nice. I'm also a massive fan of Tootsie uh, with Dustin Hoffman. He worked on that as well as all three Back to the Future films. I saw all three of them at the Empire Leicester Square the first time that they ever showed the third one. It was a special, like we're doing all three of them and this is the first time the third one's shown in the UK, even before the actual UK premiere so that was great done david i oh, will listen dude um wayne's got my facebook uh, details so um just uh, he can get my email as well uh, whatever method you prefer to contact me yeah. and david's uh, book is called best seat in the house it's terrific check it out listen fantastic well we'll get on david and we'll talk all about it and uh, your experiences that'd be great I i'd love that 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 would be fantastic so okay so geronimo was on my list at my number three so that brings us to and your number three was um the same as my number four so, so that brings two. that brings us to our number two so what's your number two trespass ah uh, that's interesting again that's a that's a film that when i went to see it i, I mean i'll be honest i was knackered uh i remember and and we saw two we saw two movies we saw groundhog day and trespass the same night well, wow. and interesting um, little bill. <laughs> yeah, was it? I mean, that you know, you wouldn't put them in the same camp, would you, really? Mm. Um, and I, I've got to be honest, I fell asleep during Trespass. I did rent it again. Yeah. Um, that's terrible to admit. I'm so sorry, Walter, but uh, I was I was very tired at the time. Yeah. Well, again, I think this is a um, seriously underrated Walter Hill movie. You know, and it's, he's he's working with some amazing people here, Lloyd Hearn, Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton, William Sadler, Ice T, Ice Cube, you know, and such an intense movie, claustrophobic piece of work. And it's, of course, it's kind of a, I guess it's an, an homage to Treasure of the Sierra Madre in the same way that Extreme Prejudice is to what to the Wild Bunch. You know, he's, he's yeah, very... I can, yeah, I can, I can see that. I can see yeah. that. So, um, it, you know, a controversial movie in its time because it had come out at the same time as the the LA riots, the Rodney King situation. So Universal 
had a very kind of hands-off approach to promoting it and wanting have a, having anything to do with it. So it unfortunately went under the radar, you know, and especially over here, I don't know about the UK, but I think over in Ireland, it came straight to video, which was, I think the first straight to video Walter Hill movie in Ireland, which was. No, uh, it, 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 de it definitely got a cinema release. I mean, Geronimo didn't get a nationwide, but what tended to happen was films would back in the day, this was right up until the mid to late nineties, Mm -hmm. films would release in the West end of London, sometimes six weeks ahead of a national release. Yeah. Um, be, be between three to six weeks. Um, but I saw trespass on general release cause I was living in Reading then. And we went to this, um, multiplex in Bracknell, which is an awful town that's got nothing to, to recommend it in this full of roundabouts. But we went there and we saw those. T I remember that it was that double bill trespass and groundhog day. Yeah. Um, which must've been out the, the same year um yeah i mean it's the one with ice t there's like two firemen there's the treasure in the building there's lots of lots of fire happens and i love yeah. i absolutely love bill paxton god rest his soul um yeah. but it's just it's a very intense movie you know and yeah it just shows what walter could do with a limited cast of about i don't think there's any more than eight people in the movie you know you have eight central characters and it's just what happens between two rooms, you know, one camp, is the, one camp, the two camps are either side of a door. Yeah, that's right. That, that tension between the two of them as they try and escape from each other, you know, and it's just. Uh, am I right in thinking Devro White was the guy who drove Bruce Willis in Die Hard? Is that the that's Argyle? Argyle, from Argyle Die Hard. right? Yeah, and in and the, also, the movie, he was like a he was like a junkie, like a heroin addict. He needed he needed a fix, didn't he? And he was. Sort That's of like right. he was, um, you know. Uh, thanks for that, Josh. Uh, there's there's, the, there's several links to Die Hard here because um, Bill Bill Sadler was obviously the villain in Die Hard Two. Die Hard Two, and then yeah. Art, um, I can't remember his second name, escapes me right now. He's the he's the guy who's stuck in the room with Paxton and Sadler, but he was also in Die Hard Two as well. So there's a few connections, but um, on this, because I love the movie so much, you might notice that the chapter in the book is quite large. And again, I, I, was I haven't read I haven't read the chapter on Trespass yet. Oh, watch it first, then read the chapter. It'll make more sense. But I was lucky enough, again, thanks to David. He introduced me to Neil, who produced it, and Bob Gale, who David also worked with on Back to the Future. Oh, oh my and God, so, yeah, Bob Gale. Yeah, wow. so basically the, the film was written by the Back to the Future crew, Neil Canton, Bob Gale, and Robert Zemeckis. So this is a script that went back all the way to the 70s when these guys were in... In film school or whatever it was but it just it was too similar to deliverance it was too similar to fort patchy the bronx to make back then it was too hot a topic right but ir ironically enough when they made it then in 1990 or 91 it was very hot topic as well because of you know the the, the situation going on in los angeles at the time with the riots so it, it, it seemed to be unable to shake off any kind of socio-political controversy that would hang over it no matter what time of you no, know, whatever decade it was going to be released, it was going to be controversial, you know. So um, there yeah, was a yeah. lot of there were some reshoots to make the ending a bit less kind of racially and you know racial animosity in there. Yeah. So it's That's it's unfortunate that it came out in the time that it did, but it's a terrific film and aesthetically, Something it is so it. unusual as well. It kind of prefigured the whole found footage thing because it's a mix of classically shot film footage, as we can see here. But also, there's a lot of VHS footage, so it was very experimental in a way for a major Universal studio I, release. I, I also remember that it was the first time I can recall a gang using mobile phones in a movie. They had those flip phones with the little, and that must have been a sponsorship deal um, <laughs> because that, that they were they were the phone at the time. Yeah, like well, between that and the video cameras, I'm sure they. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So they put, yeah, it was probably a uh, that was probably about fifty percent of the budget yeah. right there. But it's it's just a terrifically intense movie, and again, Alan Graff working the stunts and the action, and it's yeah. just incredible. And Lloyd Hearn, who became his kind of go-to cinematographer pretty much for the rest of his career, is just incredible. I mean, uh, uh, Lloyd came from television, you know, but yet he brought this unique cinematic aesthetic to this film and of course he would go on to do many films and be brilliant but it just goes to show walter knew him from back in the day you know going back to his his early years in malibu they were friends in the industry early on and he said you know listen at some stage me and you're gonna have to work together 
So when he was doing this, what, what Walter called a low budget movie, <laughs> he said, uh, I'm going to need someone new here. So I'll bring in Lloyd. Let's see what Lloyd can do. And Lloyd brought in this completely new aesthetic of mixing film footage and VHS footage. And it's just a superb piece of work, piece of art, if you ask me. I'm going to look at it with completely fresh eyes when I go back to watch it. In fact, I'll go Excellent. back and watch that and another 48 hours again um, just to reevaluate them, especially for this. Because uh, I watched a lot of other Waterhill stuff for this stream, but I didn't watch those two because they were, yeah. two, my, they were again, two films at the time. I didn't like them. I, yeah. No, no, I didn't like them, but I liked them, but, but I, I wanted more. I know uh, what you mean. And it's, yeah. as, as I say, that's these are the thing, these are the reasons I think why me and Walter... Um, had such great conversations because when he found out I love these movies as much as I did, he was like, why doesn't anybody else love them as much as you do? <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's not on my top five, but probably number six for me probably would be Johnny Handsome. That's a movie I really love. And That's I think it's got a great story and a, a, a brilliant performance from Mickey Rourke. And I thought it was massively underrated, you know. Oh, and the always terrific Lance Henriksen, who is a superb villain. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and he, uh, you know, that I think that film came out around the same time as the vampire movie he did with, Near Dark. Um, yeah, Near Dark. With, uh, of course, that was uh, Catherine Bigelow's like first movie, mm. and um, well, you know, we don't, we could do a whole different stream about her, couldn't we? Yeah. Well, that brings us um, on to my number two choice, which we don't need to linger on too much because we we've, we've kind of skirted around it already. My my number two is actually Forty Eight Hours. Okay, um, it's going to be on my list because it was the first Walter Hill film. Like I said, I saw it at the cinema. I saw it with my dad and uh, you know, who I miss dearly. And, and one of the things that really connected me and my dad together was our, our love of movies. Uh, and um, I particularly like the action scenes in, in, you know, up until I saw 48 hours, my kind of experience of sort of cop buddy stuff, was a Starsky and Hutch, which it was a special treat, you know, to mm. get to stay up and watch that on a Friday. And, you know, that had gunplay and stuff in it, but it was all very TJ Hooker vanilla. This was kind of a similar world, but, the, the, you know, the killers were real killers in this yeah. in, in this world. And this world was gritty and grimy. And, the you know, and then, of course, the scene where they go into the cowboy bar. Uh, and, Josh, if you haven't seen that movie, again, it's another one you've got to If he's a good director, he will do that. And they did that. And, you know, Larry Gross and him had a kind of a eureka moment when they were shooting or rehearsing that country bar sequence. Right. And they seen Eddie riffing and going off and doing his... Bad guy bikers and all that. Yeah. And I, I, they, they, for me as well, felt like they were from a different film. And uh, and again, this is just my thoughts of what I remember. And I I did rent it again when I, I saw yeah. it at the cinema. I rented it again. But, I, I, I you know, I should watch it again. Yeah, um, And it's interesting you say that because I think the complete opposite. I think that the, the villains in another 48 hours are almost more appealing and more interesting than the Murphy and Nulty characters. And maybe that's a bad sign that we, you know, we should, well, be, we should be interested yeah, in. I mean, uh, <laughs> you kind of said it there, really. But, well, yeah. let's leave that one there. That brings us on to number one. Now, we don't need to talk about my number one because we've already talked about it because my number one is Streets of Fire. Oh, See, cause okay. that, because for me, it's such a different movie in a way. I mean, it's still a Western and it's still got all those Walter Hill tropes. But for me, it, 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 it's because it's got the great songs. And, I, I, you know, even though, you know, it's a lot for Michael Perret, who was such a young novice actor at the time. And I yeah. read the whole section of it in your book, uh, you know, actually actually read it for the uh, I read that and about four other bits um, yeah. in preparation for the Alan Graff interview. Um, because I wanted to ask him loads of things about Streets of Fire, and it was great to hear all the stories about, you know, the, the struggles they had with it and this, that, and the other. But I, I love it, and 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 it's a film that's grown on me in time because the the bits that seemed cheesy then seem to work a lot better now, yeah. um, because because the whole film feels set within this bubble that's like a parallel universe, and once you accept that. I think I think the film becomes a lot more um, sort of believable in the universe that it that that Walter intended it to be set in, yeah. which is like this parallel world. Absolutely, um, and the idea that you you can it's it's you know comic books are a big thing these days, and that it came it was born of a comic book mentality, and that yeah. they 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 viewed this as a potential comic book after the film. 
says something a lot too about its sensibilities. And also Larry Gordon, the producer who I spoke to, he said, it's interesting that it seems to have rode the wave of 80s nostalgia, both for music and cinema in recent times, that it's been rediscovered as a kind of a lost classic of 80s movies based, you know, because of the soundtrack, because of the, the style, the overt 80s neon thing that's going on. So I can see why, you know, it's celebrated these days more so than in the last 30 years, because, you know, these things come around in cycles, don't they? You know, yeah, in, whatever it'll be next decade will be 90s nostalgia or whatever it is. I'm upset now because I've just realized that my Blu-ray of Streets of Fire is not the collector's edition, which is the shout version, which I'm the Shout Factory edition, which I have, which is brilliant. Yeah. I mean, this one, this version has got loads of cool stuff on it. It's got, you know, Mm. sort of a making of and great interviews that they did at at the time and since. Yeah. um, Which is nice. Was oh Corey Feldman at an event for Streets of Fire? I was gonna say I don't remember Corey Feldman no. being in Street. Well, that, that we, we talked about Streets of Fire earlier. That is my number one. So that brings us to your number one. So tell us why Dead for a Dollar is your number one choice. <laughs> Not quite dead for a dollar, but um let me just say that this was very hard to compile a list of my favorite Walter Hill movies because I don't think there's one movie one Walter Hill movie I don't like. I certainly have my favorites. I certainly have the ones which I feel are a little bit lesser. But to pick a number one, to pick a favorite Walter Hill, it yeah. probably seems, it's quite arbitrary, but to put it in context of this conversation and ranking him down and why I love certain things, it's going to be Last Man Standing. Oh, okay. Well, we're, yeah, we're, we're back on that. Well, we, we didn't, I didn't click on the pictures of that earlier, so let's, let's get it So up. I think this is, um, this is everybody who works with Walter working at their best and i say that about lloyd Hearn and his cinematography freeman davies and his editing roy cooter and his music but i think it's the best music that roy cooter has ever made and i don't just mean his soundtracks i mean his solo albums is one of no I, I agree the, 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 i remember the music in the cinema and it was it was very affecting yeah um, and it's, oh, it, the late it's a film noir movie. it's a western but, you know, one of the things me and Walter connected on was was over this movie because we, we spoke a lot about Raoul Walsh and our love of old old Westerns and old Hollywood. And I, I spoke about this being in many ways a, an homage to that cinema, the cinema of that period. And I also said I find it extremely an emotional experience, which I've, I've rarely seen or never seen a critic mention this or any writer or analyst mention that it is a very affecting emotional film. And Walter said that was his intention. And that's the reason that Akira Kurosawa's family and his family said yes to Walter doing this because, and they, the reason that they liked it because Walter got it because, you know, it, it relates back to um, Red Harvest and Kurosawa and Fistful of Dollars and all these touchstones, you know, because it's a remake of remake of remake, all this kind of thing. But Walter said this was never intended to be a remake. He said he's not crazy enough to remake kurosawa no he'll, he'll adapt it but you know it's it's gone through various you know forms of life over the the decades throughout the, the history of cinema and i just think he nailed it more than leone did with a fistful of dollars he nailed the tone of that story you know yes it's a violent story about gangs fighting off against each other but it's also about this solitary man who's just wandering through life, not knowing where he's going, and he meets people fleetingly. And that's just, I don't know, there's something about that story that really affects me. And in combination with the aesthetics, Walter's yeah. direction, uh, Roy's music, it just gets me every damn time. And I've, it's interesting, I've had a weird relationship with it. When I first saw it, when it first came out in, I think, 96, 97, I, I didn't like it as a Bruce Willis movie. I thought it was a good Walter Hill movie. But... I, I I agree. I, I was in. I was compl- I was. I was expecting a different film when I went to watch it. I, yeah. I thought it was going to be more, not comedic, but I thought it was going to have that balance between action and light that yeah. was inhabiting. That's, that's the Bruce Willis we got to know and love, which was this kind of gregarious, moonlighting slash diehard yeah. kind of character. And then immediately in the opening frames of this film, you hear this gruff Robert Mitchum type voiceover which immediately sets the tone along with Roy's music. And you know you're in for a different kind of movie. And of course, New Line did not market the movie appropriately. The trailer's completely off tone, I think. You know, it's just, it doesn't do the film any justice whatsoever. It does give the impression that it's a bit more of a high-octane action movie. 
but yeah. it's not. It's very much a tone poem. And that sounds pretentious, but I don't care. It is. It's a piece well, of art in every well, respect. Well, I, I, the, the, the thing that I thought about it when I rewatched it, um, and I've watched it many times over the years, and I'm so glad I did see it in the cinema, was the first thing that comes into my head when Willis first, um, you know, appears on screen is, uh, you know, and behold, there was a pale rider sat on a horse and his name was Death. And, and yeah. it's almost like his, you're not really sure if his character is um, off this earth. There's, there's a kind of, there's a great sort of mystical quality to him that he's, it's like he's a, it's like he's a superhero Mm. undercover and you would just never know and and that's the kind of superhero movie i'd like to see today where i yeah, don't he's know kind of the this... guy's really a superhero you know yeah he's like um, this angel angel of death walking through the, the desert yeah. landscape to southwest or whatever and you know he's come to just earn a few quid you know meet a girl and move on but is, it's, that, it's... is that the back lot at mgm for the the town stuff no, um, that was, I can't remember the name of the place, but it's a place they've used for various Westerns down the years. And they used actually the, the exact same street they used for Walter's Wild Bill. Right. Okay. So that's, that's the um, Deadwood, Deadwood Street. Yeah. Cause I don't, it's not the Silverado set. Um, no. Cause I'd recognize no. that. And uh, Matt, Matt, by the way, Matthew Holmes and I, we're going to do a stream. Don't know whether you'd like to be on this with us. Uh, we can, we can try and arrange it if you're free. We're sure. going to do a stream about standing Western sets that still exist today. And we're going to go and look at them all on Google Earth. And because oh, wow. we, we did a few when we were doing Yellowstone, we went and looked at some of the sets. And then mm. uh, we, we did another stream about our top 10 Westerns. And uh, we went and looked at the Silverado. And Matt said, why don't we do a stream about going and looking at all the Western sets that are still out there, including the ones in Spain? And, and I thought, yeah, that's great. That's a great idea. So we're going to do that at some point. So if you Excellent. Fancy... Let, me know, let me know. And if I'm free, come yeah, up. if you're free and you want to be on that. Um, yeah, it's funny because Last Man Standing, when I when I first watched it, and I love my action. It was it was weird. It was a weird film to digest because it felt like there was just action in it and, and not a lot else. And, and, and all the characters were horrible and you couldn't you couldn't really put pin down who bruce willis was so it was one of those movies where i was like who am i supposed to care about in this film and then yeah. but then i when i watched it again when mm -hmm. i was a bit older and a bit more film cerebral and um i realized that's not <clears throat> the point of the film and yeah. um uh, uh and yeah i mean it, it it's on my list at number five it's it's it's, it's interesting that it's my number five and it's your number one and i i, I think yeah for me it's it's not the it's not the ultimate walter hill film for me but i can see why it would be the ultimate walter hill film for somebody because it's yeah, got I mean, all of his tropes in one ball and if you like the gangster genre and western it's all there yeah i mean it's saying it's my number one as well i mean it's my number one today and it probably will be most other days but i mean it's it's even for me it's probably not even necessarily the definitive walter hill movie it's just for some reason it resonates with me on an emotional level on an aesthetic level and it's an interesting experience in a, one's relationship to cinema because as i say i i grew i grew to love it over time you know i, yeah. I disliked it at first I thought, okay, it's an interesting Walter Hill movie. I don't like it as a Bruce Willis film. But then I understood the movie a bit more. Of course, as one learns about Kurosawa and Red Harvest and Dashiell Hammett and all these background influences and inspirations, mm. is it makes more sense as yeah, you come yeah. back to it and you reintroduce yourself. And you're, it's because I always think that cinema is films are a living thing. They, we, we evolve with them, we have a relationship with them as we do with our friends and family and everything else. And you can't just write something off once, I think, say, don't like it, never going to go back there again. Because you could go back 10 years later and have a completely different relationship with that film because you've changed. Yeah. Perhaps the film has changed in context of society and art and everything else. So film grows with us, I think. You know, and this is very highfalutin, but it's the way I, I approach cinema. You know, to go back to some of these films that initially I didn't like so much and then to approach them in a different context and go wow i love this film and yeah that's yeah I, is probably the best example i i'm, I'm with you on that 100 percent because when i first watched it i kind of thought eh, you know it was all right and i was a bit like that with um 
a film which I think is in in a very similar mill pond, um, which mm. is the Cohen brothers, um, the Irish one with the hat. Um, Miller, Miller's Crossing. Miller's Crossing. Thank you. And it's set in that beautiful time period where the old west is kind of gone but there's still some of the architecture there and 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 then you've got that the 1920s technology the cars the tommy guns the hats the 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 suits and i i love that era because it's a there's just one one stage of history seeping out and the other one is ingratiating itself um uninvited almost and um, you know I, i i really do um like that about this movie um so i I think it's a great number one pick Um, yeah production design art design costume design cinematography it's just everything everybody is working at their peak i think on this movie and apart from anything else even if even if it wasn't say a great bruce willis film from if you're looking at it from that perspective i think just from an aesthetic point of view an artistic point of view it it rarely a walter hill film rarely gets better than this i think well, look, that's a great place to wrap up because we're at 90 minutes and I, I try not to keep my guests on uh, longer than that. And I've also got to do a uh, Zoom call with uh, uh, somebody in the States um, in about 15 minutes. So um, uh, I've just chucked a link in the chat there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re-edit all that stuff tomorrow. Um, you, I, I highly recommend uh, Wayne's uh, book on Walter Hill if you're a Walter Hill uh, fan, you're going to find an awful lot of minutiae stories about the goings on of, of how and uh, why these things got made and what the influences were and who was pulling in what direction. Um, it's a really, really informative book. And um, I've I've digested about 60% of it and uh, I'm still going back to it and rereading bits of it. And I had and this whole chapter, so I haven't read the, read the chapter on Trespass yet. I, you see what I did? I was terrible. I picked out all my favorite films and read those bits, but I like that about your book, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, I recommend that. Uh, as I said earlier in the stream, uh, Wayne has also got fantastic books on the Elm Street movies, um, uh, Burt Reynolds, um, Tom DeCillo, which is uh, a, a whole other conversation that I would love to pick up on. It'd be great to have you back another time because there's a million other things we could we could talk about, um, and um, you know it's been it's been great having you on. And I, I, anyone who loves film as much as me, if you've got something I can promote or we can talk about together, I'm all for it. And uh, uh, David uh, McGifford, if you're up for coming on, please do get in touch with me. Um, I'm directing a play uh, at the beginning of June, so May is a bit of a heavy. Uh, time for me but i am going to do a couple of interviews in may so if we can fit you in in may that'd be great if not june would be would be good um wayne uh wh- where can people find you is uh are you on twitter that kind of thing do, are you looking for people to follow you anywhere yeah not on twitter anymore but i am on instagram so wayne burn otter um you can probably I'm, not, I'm on facebook as well you can find me somehow on facebook i'm sure but uh, wayne burn otter on instagram is generally the one i tend to use a bit more just for fantastic everything i don't post prolifically you might see me sitting there in my pajamas having a glass of wine and that's about it that's the height (laughs) of my uh that's my content i I did find some very entertaining photographs of you when you were a lot younger um, oh dear with with a very different aesthetic and i thought should we put these up for a laugh and i thought no let's not please don't (laughs) um but uh we can always threaten to do that next time when damn uh, internet listen uh this has been great um honestly and Thank you also for giving up your your time uh, to come on the channel. We're a small channel, but we're growing. This is the kind of stuff I love doing. Um, and uh, I've got to say that, that doing this YouTube channel has been a big uh, help for me um, personally from a mental health point of view. It's been a pretty challenging couple of years. Um, I'm nearly up to 2,000 subscribers now. Um, that's in large part to some of the support that I've had from the YouTube community. Those people know who they are. So thank you very much for that. And um, I aim to keep going and keep growing. And this is the sort of thing I want to do as well as review my older favorite films and talk about them and stuff. So um, if you're a creative and you've either worked in one of the creative industries or you're a a young one and you're doing your first graphic novel or you've got a crowdfunding campaign for your comic on uh, Kickstarter or whatever, if you've got something that looks interesting and you want to come on and talk about it, I may well have you on. You do not have to be the most famous person in the world. You just have to have something interesting that is creative or worked within the creative realm. So just get in touch with us at the Outcast Creative via our Facebook page. And uh, listen, we shall see you all again 
real soon. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Thanks to my mods, uh, Josh and Mr. Brown, for popping in as well. And uh, guys, I'm doing my weekly roundup tomorrow at 8 o'clock. It's only it's going to be a quick one for about an hour. I think I've got Copa Catania and uh, George coming on to do it with me again. And then this weekend coming, there's not a lot happening because of, I'm starting rehearsals for False Accounts again. And there'll be some streams about False Accounts coming, so look out for those as well. Thank you again, Wayne, for coming on. Thank you for those people watching. Do like and subscribe, and we'll see you all again real soon. Thanks, guys.